Recently, Elon Musk, Sam Altman, and the CEO of Grok, G-R-O-Q, the company that makes computer chips that blow away NVIDIAs for large language model processing, have all said that compute is going to be the new most important thing in the world, and it has massive consequences, and actually it turns out that Tesla has an ace up its sleeve. Let's take a look. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. I'm gonna start with a couple of quick videos from Sam Altman and the CEO of Grok, and then also look at an article that covers a recent interview that Elon Musk did. Every one of these makes me think that compute is actually going to become the quote, money of the future, and that the big players in compute and AI are going to get very, very wealthy, and like I said in the intro, that Tesla has an ace up its sleeve. So let's start with a clip of Sam Altman, who is the CEO of OpenAI, of course, speaking with Lex Friedman recently. I think compute, is going to be the currency of the future. I think it will be maybe the most precious commodity in the world. And I think we should be investing heavily to make a lot more compute. Uh, compute is, it's an unusual, I think it's going to be an unusual market. Um, you know, people think about the market for like chips for mobile phones or something like that. And you can say that, okay, there's 8 billion people in the world. Maybe 7 billion of them have phones. Maybe there are 6 billion, let's say. They upgrade every two years. So the market per year is 3 billion system on chip for smartphones. And if you make 30 billion, you will not sell 10 times as many phones because most people have one phone. But compute is different. Like intelligence is going to be more like energy or something like that, where the only thing that I think makes sense to talk about is at price X, the world will use this much compute. And at price Y, the world will use this much compute. Mm -hmm. Um, because if it's really cheap, I'll have it like reading my email all day, like giving me suggestions about what I maybe should think about or work on and trying to cure cancer. And if it's really expensive, maybe I'll only use it or will only use it to try to cure cancer. So I think the world is going to want a tremendous amount of compute. And there's a lot of parts of that that are hard. Uh, energy is the hardest part. Building data centers is also hard. The supply chain is hard. And then, of course, fabricating enough chips is hard. Um, but this seems to me where things are going. Like we're going to want an amount of compute that's just hard to reason about right now. Okay, so a lot to unpack there. First of all, he's talking about compute having a kind of unlimited total addressable market or TAM, as opposed to something like a smartphone where there's only so many of these guys that you can really realistically sell in a year because there's just not a demand for more smartphones. Once everyone on the planet had a smartphone, you know, theoretically, so 8 billion or so is kind of the maximum you could even imagine for the total addressable market. He makes it more like 3 billion, but whatever. So you're talking about, you know, there's a definite cap to the number of computer chips that you need to power those smartphones and screens, etc. But what he's saying here is that compute for doing AI work in particular is basically unlimited. If we had all of the energy in the world, if we had all of the chips in the world, if these things became very, very inexpensive to operate, then people are going to just want an almost infinite amount of it, right? That compute is effectively intelligence. And so we want more and more and more of it. And it's a really interesting insight. And it also explains to some extent why he's been going around asking for $7 trillion. To him, that amount of money, even though it's kind of a ludicrous amount of money, it doesn't matter because they will utilize, the world the globe will utilize more than $7 trillion worth of compute if it's available. Now, the things he talks about, electricity is a massive problem. You've got to provide electricity for this stuff. We'll get to Transformers in just a minute with Elon Musk's interview. But if assuming we've got all of that stuff, we still need chips. And it's also got to become inexpensive enough to operate. So if the energy budget is too big and it's too expensive to run this stuff, people will only use it for very important things. Whereas if it's really inexpensive to run it, people will use it for everything, like checking your email or something. And the really interesting aspect of this is this becomes the most important, precious, whatever you want to call it, thing. My precious, right? Sam Altman's like Gollum or something at this point. The precious, horrible hours. But compute is precious, and what is precious to us right now? Well, it's money. So in a sense, what happens is compute becomes money, and those who have control over the compute, the companies and governments or anybody else that is controlling this compute effectively controls the money of the future. If you think about it, intelligence is what everyone is after. If you're a relatively intelligent person and you can maximize your value to the economy or whatever, you can make a good deal of money, whereas if you 
you don't have as much intelligence, you don't produce as much money, generally speaking, right? Within a statistical norm. But anyway, what we're talking about here is intelligence beyond what humans are capable of doing, especially if we look at like really large scale installations of this kind of a thing, assuming that the energy and all of that stuff is available. So that intelligence, which could be orders of magnitude more than all of humanity collectively, let alone one individual person, becomes effectively the new money of the world and old money will not be nearly as important. So keep this in mind as we read a couple of outtakes from Elon's recent interview. Spring has sprung and it's nice to be able to get out, enjoy the weather, and have a drink or two with friends. But of course you want to have a great next day too. That's why I love Zbiotics. Zbiotics allows me to enjoy nights out in moderation while feeling awesome the next morning. Zbiotics Pre-Alcohol Probiotic is the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by PhD scientists to tackle rough mornings after drinking. Here's how it works. When you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. It's this byproduct, not dehydration that's to blame for your rough next day. Zbiotics Pre-Alcohol Probiotic produces an enzyme to break this byproduct down. It's designed to work like your liver, but in your gut where you need it most. Just remember to drink Zbiotics before drinking alcohol, drink responsibly, and get a good night's sleep to feel your best tomorrow. Go to zbiotics.com slash Dr. No or scan the QR code on the screen right now to get 15% off your first order when you use Dr. No at checkout. You can also sign up for a subscription using my code so you can stay prepared no matter the time or occasion. And Zbiotics is backed with a 100% money back guarantee. So if you're unsatisfied for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. When my wife misinformation and I enjoy an evening in Athens, I drink a bottle of Zbiotics before hanging out with her and our friends. I stay hydrated between drinks and the next day I feel great. Zbiotics is a real game changer for fun nights. Be sure to head to zbiotics.com slash Dr. No and use the code Dr. No at checkout for 15% off. Thanks to Zbiotics for sponsoring this episode and now let's get back to it. All right, and here we have a My Electric Sparks article. Elon Musk says AI will run out of electricity and transformers in 2025. By the way, links to all this stuff is in the description, of course. I've never seen any technology advance faster than this. The chip shortage may be behind us, but AI and EVs are expanding at such a rapacious rate that the world will face supply crunches in electricity and transformers next year. That's 2025, says Elon Musk. In a recent Q&A to close the Bosch Connected World Conference, the recent Nobel Peace Prize nominee, Elon Musk, the tech entrepreneur behind companies like Tesla and XAI, has sounded the alarm about a looming shortage in electricity and transformers. This shortage, he said, is a result of the rapid growth in artificial intelligence and electric vehicles. Continuing on here, Musk highlighted the astonishing rate at which AI computing power is growing, likening it to a modern-day gold rush. With AI companies like XAI needing huge amounts of computing power, the electricity demand is expected to skyrocket. And this is a quote from Musk. The artificial intelligence compute coming online appears to be increasing by a factor of 10 every six months. Later, I've heard him modify that to six to nine months, but anyway, it's, it's very, very fast. Like, obviously, that cannot continue at such a high rate forever, or it'll exceed the mass of the universe, but I've never seen anything like it. The chip rush is bigger than any gold rush that's ever existed. Speaking of money, he compares the chip rush to a gold rush, a literal rush for, you know, what we used to value as money, as gold. And then continuing with Elon speaking here, then the next shortage will be electricity. They won't be able to find enough electricity to run all the chips. So, you know, basically we've had chip shortages and all that stuff, but once we have enough chips, where do we get the power to actually run this? I think next year you'll see that they just can't find enough electricity to run all the chips, he added. The simultaneous growth of electric cars and AI, both of which need electricity, both of which need voltage transformers, I think is creating a tremendous demand for electrical equipment and for electrical power generation. And then, of course, you can see here the, the transformer demand and basically power transformer market size and how it's increasing. But Elon has said in other places how the transformer industry is not designed to ramp rapidly. They build a certain number of transformers every year. And, you know, it was relatively stable up to 2022 and it's starting to take off. And it doesn't look like that much more, but it's actually a lot when your industry is not designed to build things rapidly, to scale rapidly and build more than you were expected to build previously. Continuing with Elon quotes, the 
constraints on AI compute are very predictable. A year ago, the shortage was chips, neural net chips. Then it was very easy to predict that the next shortage would be voltage step down transformers. You've got to feed the power to these things. If you've got 100 to 300 kilovolts coming out of a utility and it's got to step down all the way to six volts, that's a lot of stepping down stated Musk. So not only does it have to go down to 240 volts to get into an industrial thing like a factory or something like that or a data center, it's then got to step down to potentially 120 volts and then down to something that runs on your computer, which is on the order of six volts. So many, many step down transformers involved in this chain. My not that funny joke is that you need transformers to run transformers. You know, the AI is like, there's a thing called a transformer in AI. I don't know. It's a combination of sort of neural networks. Anyway, they're running out of transformers to run transformers, said Musk. And of course, if you don't know what neural network transformers are, definitely check out this video and plenty of other ones on the internet. You know, there are plenty of people who talk about the neural network version of transformers. And finishing up here, I think we really are on the edge of probably the biggest technology revolution that has ever existed. You know, there's supposedly a Chinese curse. May you live in interesting times. Well, we live in the most interesting of times. And then he goes on to talk about how he's become more optimistic lately. And finally, let's turn to Jonathan Ross, who's the CEO of Grok, G-R-O-Q, not the one that Elon Musk owns, but this is a hardware company. He used to work for Google, I think Google DeepMind, if I remember correctly. But anyway, they've built a chip from the ground up to do large language model inference at incredibly high speed. It will do thousands of tokens per second. So in other words, instead of watching the little thing like this when ChatGPT is responding to you, it's like, and you get the entire response at once. Like so fast that you can't even believe that it was actually typed out and not just sort of displayed by the computer instead. And of course, something that's this fast and this efficient at running large language models has huge implications. I really do need to do a video on Grok sometime soon. If anybody from Grok wants to talk to me, definitely hit me up on X or, you know, email me directly or something like that. I would love to do an interview with any of you. But anyway, continuing on here, let's take a listen as the new oil. And wow. the, the reason it, think, think about it this way. We were in an information age where you would make copies of data with high fidelity and you distribute it. That's what the internet was. That's what mobile was. But that's also what the printing press was. They're effectively the same type of technology, just at a different scale. And even though it was the same type of technology at a different scale, even that was hard for our intuitions to adapt to. But generative AI is not an information age technology because you're not making copies of something. You're making something new in the moment. And the difference is when you're making something new and in the moment, you need compute to do that. It's not about retrieving something from a hard drive, doing a little bit of compute and sending it out. You are creating it in response to a particular question. And what we often see is people will train a model and then they'll go, mission accomplished, we've succeeded. Now we're gonna put it into production. And then all of a sudden they realize they're gonna to have to spend 10 to 20 X to deploy it. And so you spend your money when you're training the models, you make your money when you're actually doing inference. Okay, so the big point here is that Jonathan talks about the difference between the previous kind of universe and the new one. The previous universe was content retrieval. So if you want something, what do you do? You Google it, right? If you don't offhand know the answer to it. So you're like, uh, who won the 1935 World Series or something? If you don't happen to know the answer already, type it into Google, you get an answer. So there is a certain amount of compute involved in that because of course Google has to run some algorithms and things like that to figure out the most likely result that is going to satisfy you. They're really good at that now, which is why they dominate search results. But that is fundamentally different than asking something like a chat GPT or something like that, who won the 1935 World Series, because then it's generating the answer for you. Now, someplace back in its knowledge base, and you might not even be sure that it's accurate or not, right? Because it's generating this answer. So it might give you a false answer, but regardless of the falsity or truth of it, it's a fundamentally different thing going on. One of them is, Let's go find off the internet the best information that we have that's stored someplace on a hard drive somewhere, pull it up, send it into the cloud, send it over to you, and here is the result along with a whole bunch of other possibilities. In the other case, it's you make a request, a bunch of computations are done, statistically most likely next words pop out of something and then that is sent back to you. Same thing with images or something, right? If you're doing content retrieval for, I want uh, a picture of, uh, of a puppy or something like that, right? So I want a picture of a dog, a puppy. It, you actually go on Google or wherever else and you search for it and you get a bunch of results that are actual pictures of puppies, at least until recently. When you ask a generative AI to do that, it generates pictures of puppies. Those are not real pictures. They are not pictures that existed before. It's creating those in the moment. And the generative nature of knowledge that's happening now takes a massive amount more compute power than does retrieval. 
So in order for this compute to happen, we need number one chips, and, and it could be Grok chips as opposed to NVIDIA chips because they're gonna be much more efficient in terms of power efficiency per token generated per second generated or something like that. So you can get more efficient chips, but there is a certain limit to how low you can go, which means secondly, you need electricity and the ability to deliver the electricity to the computer, whether that's compute centers or something else, and stay tuned for that. So what does this mean? In the 20th century, wars were fought over oil. You can say that halfway through World War I, approximately, governments came to understand very, very well that oil was the new source of wealth and that changed the geopolitics of the world for the next century, right? From about 1915, 1916, in that area, all the way up to today. Oil was the thing. That was where money was. Nations became very, very rich. Other nations became bankrupt because they didn't have those natural resources. It was a, a fundamental shift in the geopolitics of the world. What Sam Altman, Elon Musk, and Jonathan Ross are saying here is that compute is that new oil. It's no longer oil is the oil. It's how compute. And part of that compute is electricity generation as well. And that electricity generation could come from oil or coal or something, but it doesn't really matter. It can come from solar panels, can come from wind, can come from nuclear, it can come from hydro, it can come from coal, it can come from natural gas, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, how the compute is done is also heterogeneous. You can use NVIDIA chips, you can use AMD chips, you can use Grok chips, you can use other chips as well. So sort of like oil in the old days, right? It's not just Saudi Arabia that has oil. Oil. The United States has oil, Canada has oil, Venezuela has oil, lots of places have oil. So the oil is kind of fungible. It doesn't really matter where you get the oil ultimately after it's refined. Of course, at the beginning, the quality is quite different, but you know, crude oil that's been refined is a pretty fungible type of asset. And the same thing is kind of true for compute and electricity. Doesn't really matter where you get it from as long as you have enough, it's relatively fungible. Although a crazy chip like Grok's chip that can operate at a couple of orders of magnitude faster than standard chips in a specialized domain. Again, remember, it's not a general purpose compute chip, but under the specialized domain of large language models, it's not exactly fungible because this thing can produce results so much faster. So it's not a perfect analogy. It's, I guess the analogy would be like, it's like perfectly refined oil popping out of the ground as opposed to crude oil that requires refining. So the cost per token goes way down because of that, but still there is kind of a, a base level of how much energy and time it's going to take to compute the next token and large language models are not the only thing. You also want generative images, generative video, generative audio, generative everything you can think of, eventually probably sensing like feeling and taste and stuff like that. Who knows what's gonna happen? Like Sam Altman said, if you have enough compute power, you will use it for anything. You could say that intelligence abhors a vacuum and it will suck everything into it to create more intelligence if it can. So as opposed to the 20th century where wars were fought over oil and geopolitics was all about oil, this time it's going to be about compute. It's going to be about electricity generation. It's going to be about chip generation. It's going to be about the people who are smart enough and eventually the AI that's smart enough to create new algorithms to run this stuff ever faster. And as Sam Altman said, the, the, the total addressable market is kind of quite infinite. It's like as much intelligence as we can possibly get, we will utilize it and more. And so that's going to fundamentally change the nature of geopolitics. It's also going to change the nature of corporations versus governments, because as opposed to the old days where governments would kind of project their power into a geographic area to get the oil or to secure oil rights, governments are not nearly as much in charge of this as corporations are these days. So I think a lot of the balance of power is shifting towards corporations now. For better or worse, it has a positive and negative effects. The other obvious result of this is that little baby Taiwan with its incredible chip manufacturing capabilities is going to be more and more and more in focus. And China and the rest of the world are going to really start to tussle about this. And you know, if World War III is gonna start anywhere, it's probably Taiwan. Scary, scary thought, but that's really true. And if I were any governmental entity outside of China, what I would be doing right now is throwing as much money as humanly possible to create chip fabrication technology under understanding intellectual property, all of that stuff to bring chip fabs online that are not in Taiwan because that 
it's just it's just way too unstable there. I mean, Taiwan is a great country. I love the people. I wish the case was not so strong against them. Right now, they're really in the crosshairs of significant geopolitical tension. And the fact that they are making the 21st century equivalent of oil is a huge issue. And let's bring it back to Tesla now. How does Tesla have an edge in all of this stuff? Well, what they have is not just their own data centers and their own you know AI that they have in their factories and their $10 billion worth of compute costs that Elon Musk just posted about recently, they also have approximately one quarter of a trillion dollars. He conveniently put both of these things into the same post. They have a quarter of a trillion dollars worth of hardware out in the world in the form of vehicles. And those vehicles are not just electric vehicles. They're computers on wheels and the compute chips that are inside them are invaluable for doing inference work. You're not gonna really be able to train on these vehicles, but the ability for them to do distributed inference, which is what they're doing already. Driving is the process of inferring the world and what you should do next using the neural networks that have been trained elsewhere. But those inference engines can be used for other things while the car is idle. Obviously, if you're driving it, you kind of want it focusing on the road. But if it's your car and it's spending 90% of the time parked in your garage or at a parking lot at work or whatever, you could spare some compute cycles to do inference. And that inference, as Sam Altman said, is effectively money. The ability to do compute is the new money. And that means that that Tesla owners, not just through owning stock in Tesla, but through owning Teslas themselves, could eventually participate in a small way in that new monetary equivalent, which is compute power. And that's really, really cool. All right, so that's a little walk through the amazing and terrifying probabilities of the next few years in terms of compute becoming the new oil, becoming the new quasi money, and the consequences from the largest to the smallest scales. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. And while you're down there, please do like and subscribe. And a big thanks once again to ZBuy for sponsoring today's video. Be sure to check out my link in the description and save 15% off. In the meantime, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.